I'm not a huge slab furniture guy, but I do like the look of natural wood. And I saw this in a local furniture store. This was at a small chain. It's not really a high-end place, like medium-priced furniture. And I wasn't able to take a picture in the store, but they had the same thing on their website. Now, by the time you pay tax and shipping on this, if you bought it online, it would cost you around $600. Now, what kind of live edge slab table do you get for $600? Well, apparently a fake one. This is not a natural slab at all. It's several boards edge glued together to look like it's a single slab. And it's not even a live edge either. They just cut wavy edges on the outer boards and roughed them up to fake the look of live edges. According to the website, the species is black brown wood. They don't get any more specific than that. Basically, it's scraps from an Indonesian furniture factory, and someone is making a killing selling these. A simple slab table is the easiest piece of furniture you are ever going to build, if you ever build one. It's so easy that I built this one in about two hours. That is it. Two hours of labor time, and it cost me half as much as the one I saw online, and hundreds less than what the boutique shops are selling these for. Plus, mine is an actual slab of exotic canary wood, and it's not a fake live edge. It's real. I didn't even need special tools to make it. I just used a sander and a drill. Honestly, I kind of feel like I cheated. But I'm going to show you how I did it, start to finish, including applying the finish, which is what everyone seems to leave out of furniture making videos. First, you're going to have to find a slab. Now, the best place is going to be a local mill if you have access to it. That's somewhere where a guy or, or girl has a portable bandsaw and they cut up trees and dry them themselves. You're probably going to pay about half as much at a place like that. But if you do buy a rough sawn slab, you're going to have to flatten it. And that is going to add to the tools and time required. Now there are lots of videos online about flattening slabs with a router and a homemade jig if you want to go that route. But I promise to show you how to do this without those tools and all that extra time. It's going to cost you a little bit more, but you can buy pre-flattened slabs online. I got this one from Rockler. They are all first come, first serve, and their selection is going to change based on what they have on hand. But I picked up a 17-inch wide, 50-inch long slab of canary wood for about $130. Again, this is an exotic wood, and it's pre-flattened, so I am paying a premium for it. But the time and the labor it saves me makes it well worth it. I also picked up some steel legs. These come in a wide variety of styles and start as low as about 25 bucks a set. The ones I settled on are extra tall and pretty heavy duty, so they came in around $100 for the pair. The shipping on both that big heavy slab and the heavy steel legs was only around 30 bucks, and that was a lot less than I was expecting. And my slab arrived in relatively good shape. It was pretty flat, but it wasn't perfect. There was a slight twist from end to end. Now that's the downside of buying a pre-flattened slab. It's already been planed down to just under an inch and a quarter thick, so that doesn't give me much room to flatten it any further. Fortunately, this isn't enough twist to worry about. If the table doesn't sit flat, I can add a shim where one of the legs mount beneath the table top and that will correct it. One thing that was nice was how they had already filled most of the imperfections with a wood matching putty. If you've ever worked with slabs, you know that filling knot holes and worm holes and other imperfections is usually just part of the process. And I did spot two or three small ones that remained unfilled, but I decided to just leave those as is and call them character. As I said, the real benefit of pre-flattened slabs is you can get straight to work on the sanding. Now the surface was pretty smooth already, but under some raking light I did see some ripples on the surface that came from their planer, and those had to go. So I started with 120 grit, and in just a few minutes the ripples were gone, and I was ready to go up to 180 grit. That's as high as I'm going to go because I'm going to apply a film finish. The end grain did take a bit more work, it was a little bit rougher, so I started there with 80 grit. I don't want any saw marks at all on the end grain, they have to be just as smooth as the top. Now this is when I spotted the flaw. You can see it from the underside, but it doesn't go all the way through to the top surface. I'm afraid that because of this crack, the corner might break off someday, so I've got to address it. Now normally, 
I would pull it apart as much as I could and inject some glue or epoxy in there. I might even reinforce it with a little bow tie or something. But to tell you the truth, I wasn't in love with how this end of the slab curved outward to a point. So I decided to cut three inches off and kill two birds with one stone. The crack was removed completely, and I like the shape a bit better. You're probably wondering how I clean up the live edges. Mine came with a little bark, and that has to come off, because there's just no good way to keep bark on permanently. Eventually, it's going to fall off on its own, and you don't want to do it later after the finish is on, so deal with it now. I used a putty knife to scrape off anything that was loose, then I gave the edge a good scrub with a brass brush. Brass is stiff enough to flake off anything that's not securely attached, but it's not so aggressive that it will leave a bunch of ugly scratches and gouges behind. That's important because you can't really sand a live edge like you do the surface of the slab. The goal is to just clean it up while preserving as much of the natural appearance as possible. Now the last step of sanding was to ease all the sharp edges, not just so it feels nice to the touch, but to eliminate any splinters that may catch on something and cause problems down the road. Now it's time for finish. I like General Finish's Armor Seal. It's an oil poly blend that's thin enough for wiping, so it is really easy to apply. I just puddle it on, and I wipe it around with a lint-free cotton cloth. When the surface is covered, I even it out with some nice, straight parallel strokes that go from end to end with the grain. This is the bottom side. It gets finished first, so I can then flip it over onto some painter's pyramids, and any marks that are left by those points in the surface will be on the side that doesn't get seen. The same process is applied to the top. If I get too much finish on initially, I can just squeeze the extra finish out of the cloth, and that'll dry it up enough that it can sop up the excess from on top of the slab. In the end, I'm going for relatively even coverage without any puddles anywhere, and no rag marks left in the wet surface. Armor Seal dries fairly quickly. Depending on the temperature, I can usually put one coat on in the morning and another one at the end of the workday. Between coats, I sand very lightly with 400 or 600 grit sandpaper, carefully feeling the surface with my other hand to identify any spots that aren't smooth. I can't stress enough to only use light pressure with the sandpaper. I don't want to take off all the finish I just applied. I just want to get rid of any bumps. I didn't pay as much attention to the underside, but I do try to sand at least around the perimeter between coats because people tend to run their hands on the edges of slabs, and I want their fingers to feel a smooth surface where they do touch underneath. Everything gets a second coat, and when that's dry, it's time to put on the legs. I was a little concerned that the provided screws were a little bit too short, but it's a hardwood and there are 16 total screws, so I think they should be secure enough. I definitely don't want really long screws because my top's only a bit more than an inch thick. I use tape to tell me when to stop drilling the pilot holes so I don't accidentally go all the way through the slab. That would ruin my day in a hurry. And I was careful not to over tighten the screws and strip out a hole. This isn't the type of thing that you want to just go crazy with an impact driver. With the legs in place, I can apply the final coats of finish without tying up my workbench. That's because the bottom side doesn't need more than a couple coats to seal it up, but the top can use a third and maybe even a fourth coat to give it some extra protection. I let the final coat dry a couple days, then I buff it with a piece of brown paper bag. This is roughly the equivalent of 1500 grit if you would prefer to use sandpaper. Again, I'm feeling for any bumps with my other hand, as I buff everything until it is nice and smooth. That's it. I have a real live edge table made from an actual single piece slab of beautiful exotic canary wood for about half the price that the furniture store charged and way less than what I've seen in a lot of higher end stores. And I could have done it even cheaper, but by spending a bit more on a pre-flattened slab and some steel legs, I saved a huge amount of time and labor. Now, not counting the drying time between the coats, I only have about two hours of labor in this. I do have one complaint, though. The heavy slab top is a little tippy on these particular legs. Part of that is a small twist that was in the top, but that can be corrected by shimming at one of the corners between the slab and the mounting holes for the legs. Still, I think the bends in the bottom of the legs, which effectively make them into rockers, reduce its effective width at the point where they meet the floor of bit much for the height of this table. If I were to make it again, I may go with this style instead. 
I also like that these legs have adjustable feet, which could be used to compensate for any small twist in the top without shims. I may even order a pair and swap them out on my table. Then I'll report on the difference I find over on Instagram. If you don't follow Stumpy Nubs on Instagram, you are missing out on a lot of cool behind the scenes stuff that never makes it to our YouTube video. So check that out. I also link to the legs and the slabs beneath this video at the top of the comment section if you want to check them out for yourself. But before you do, you got to see this. This is a Koenigsegg, Sweden's finest sports car. This is a Joburgs, Sweden's finest workbench. There are things for people who appreciate quality and high performance, something they can pass down to their grandkids' grandkids. You can't afford this, but this will cost you less than a good cabinet saw. Check out what Showbricks has to offer at the link below this video.